I met him 15 years ago. I was told there was nothing left, no reason, no conscience, no understanding, and even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, good or evil, right or wrong. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. These were the words that introduced us to the mythic, elusive boogeyman, Michael Myers. This was the only definition we were ever given. Absolutely everything else about Michael Myers wasn't described to us, but shown. And I truly think it's a brilliant study in the creation of a character that has next to no depth to him. In the film medium, I believe the mark of selling an authentic experience is determined by three factors. The concept, the visual language, and how hard the score slaps. The perfect application of this formula will produce iconography, and having something that the audience can identify with even after your film has come and gone is something that I think is very, very important. Something that remains with your audience and becomes a staple of your art. Whether it's the Dream King himself, or everybody's favourite homicidal doll. Don't fuck with the Chuck. <laughs> oh my god. In the case for John Carpenter's Halloween, that iconography is Michael Myers. Hi, my name is Christian, and if you're a fan of my channel, by now you'll be familiar with my deconstructive approach to themes and storytelling. It's like therapy to me. So why do I love Michael Myers? Ever since I was a kid, I steered clear of Halloween and all things spooky. Oh god, help me, please! A boogeyman in a mask that goes around stabbing people? Why would I want to watch that? Well, I thought this until recently when I decided to expand my palette and dip my toes into horror. That was when I came across what is now one of my favourite film franchises, Halloween. I found myself attaching particularly to the first film and its 2018 sequel? Sequel soft reboot? I don't know man, these timelines are hard to keep up with. I thought this was weird. Why am I still thinking about this film from 1978 that emotionally didn't do anything for me? Why did it become such a cult classic? You know me, I love thought-provoking if not pretentious storytelling. Those films that offer a slice of life, a moment in time where something monumental happens. Something that I can take a lesson from, deconstruct for years on end, or fuck it, build myself around an empathy, or lose myself in the pursuit of understanding. So, what does Halloween have to offer me? Well, uh, I don't know. Why has it stayed with me for so long? See, I'm not what you would call a conventional horror fan. Well, I wouldn't class myself as that because my exposure to the genre in its purest lovable form has only been fairly recent, like within the last year, and I couldn't exactly define its appeal to me because I'm a bit of an everyman. I adore the heartfelt, earnest truth behind the elevated horror of The Haunting of Hill House, and yet I love the stupid goofiness behind Evil Bong, Larmageddon, and the Nightmare on Elm Street films. How's this for a dream? <laughs> and whatever you do, don't mention the shunting. We don't talk about the shunting. Though I prefer the passion behind the works of Mike Flanagan, I adore the parodic silliness of the works of Wes Craven, bless his soul. I don't say this to discard the iconic ingenuity behind Scream, but to draw a comparison between the wide blanket of content that falls onto the horror sphere. Does that make me any less of a horror fan? Does that tell me that I'm watching it wrong? I don't have an answer for that. Well, at least not now. But what I do know is that there is one kind of horror that I've always found myself attaching to, as evident by my examples just now. And that is none other than the iconic, repetitive, yet repeatedly transformative, Slasher. 
The adrenaline of the chase, watching our lambs to the slaughter make their futile attempts to prolong their worthless little lives. Showing the ugliness and sheer determination of human desperation in its final, traumatizing moments. All the while, our villain, whose image is taken straight from our nightmares, taunts them before killing them in the most deliciously inventive and inhumanely disgusting ways. It's just a game to them. They revel in the thrill of the hunt. They enjoy playing with their food. An elaborate game of cat and mouse. What I believe the slasher genre does best is taking the objective, outward recount of chilling bedtime stories and inserting us right into the picture. The boogeyman that we heard would be waiting for us in our corridor as children is given a face. In fact, I think everything appealing about Michael Myers to me is the product of just a really kick-ass concept executed frighteningly well. Take these moments from Halloween, where we're given the information, Michael Myers is in the home across the road, and he's coming for you. What we see is this wide shot from Laurie's house peeking out the window to face the supposed home. What we see isn't this detailed look at our killer, but the obscured, shrunken, silhouetted image of him staring right back at us in real time. We've been thrown right into the lens of the characters, the victims, and the shot is framed for the express purpose of making us feel the fear that these characters now feel. Michael is dwarfed by his surroundings, but only just as any human would, which is why his appearance, hidden by the harsh shadows of the moonlight, serves to make him more frightening. Louis, the boogeyman's outside, look! This shot returns when we see Michael in the backyard for a fraction of a moment standing, staring silently from behind the clothesline. The daytime would tell you that you're safe, that no harm can come from something hidden in plain sight, that there is nothing that can hide in plain sight. The framing of the shot again puts you in Laurie's position, and he is mostly obscured by the foreground and his surroundings. The wide lens again throws this sense of unease over the shot as you scan the environment before seeing him standing there. Before you know it, the shot cuts away, taking us back to Laurie, confirming our fright. The shot returns to show Michael no longer standing there, which serves to gaslight the audience into disbelief, the same way that Michael's own actions serve to scare Laurie. Moments like these are how Michael Myers is made iconic. He's not just haunting our protagonist, he's haunting you. It's this concept of a stalker invading your home and watching you from afar that assisted in generating Michael's spookiness back in 1978. Framing is everything in horror, which is why this pioneer of slasher in 1978 introduced us to these vilifying concepts of screen to audience insecurity. It's a form of breaking the fourth wall that brings you into the world and by consequence closer to the conflict where you would feel the least comfortable. It's telling you, hey, you're not safe behind your screen. Michael sees you too. The utility of obscuring Michael and his environment by just using a wide lens prompts so many subconscious questions about our slasher that I believe all contribute to the element of surreal horror that is so perfectly injected into the concept of the first Halloween movie. Especially the original VHS version, obscuring Michael's eyes and expressions just because of its poor quality. The one-to-one -one aspect ratio of your box TV trapping you closer into the horror God, it was just perfect! Within these shots, which are, until the finale, the only way Michael Myers is ever framed within a scene, why is it that we can't exactly see his face? Why is it that the movie refuses to show us his face? What is director John Carpenter trying to hide? Truth be told, I don't think horror has quite recreated that perfect formula that gave Michael Myers his essence of fear since his debut in 1978. The fear behind Halloween is all down to its eagerly specific target audience that has quite impressively stood the great test of time and transformed itself, remaining more relevant now than ever. I believe Michael Myers isn't the product of explicitly his looks and attributes, but the near-perfect conception behind him at a writing level. Because let's look at this character for a moment. He's a man in a mask with a kitchen knife, and his name is... Michael Myers? <laughs> What's so scary about the name Michael Myers? It's not like Ghostface, or Freddy Krueger, or Candyman, or Leatherface. There's inherently nothing to fear about the boring old, very normal, very human name, Michael Myers.
unless you don't like Shrek. But that's where its genius lies. He's no longer a singular person. He's not someone that stands out in a crowd. Within just his boring old name alone, it plants the seed that Michael Myers could be anyone. And what does horror do best if not making you, the audience, an inclusive, helpless victim of fear in this tale of terror? This is where the appeal of horror comes for me. It's no longer the discussion of it being only the director's movie. By nature, you're part of it too. What scares you the most is wired into your subconscious. How do you see yourself and the protagonist? Do you share their fear? It's not the director's movie, it's ours. This was made apparent to me recently. The semester resumed at my university and I'm seated in this cold, dreary classroom listening to my professor talk about narrative fiction. See, I've taken this elective class that is meant to delve into short form writing, selling a concept with as few words as possible. We did an exercise in writing a short form fiction narrative in just five minutes. And there I went, writing away, blitzing it with no effort at all. But the real challenge came when we were told to do this very same exercise with our non-dominant hand. So there I was, scribbling away, barely able to write a single word with my unreliable left hand. What this exercise was for me was a transformative lesson in patience and deliberacy. Now that I didn't have the privilege of writing as fast as I thought, jamming every last detail into the picture that I wanted to paint for my reader, it forced me to slow down. It forced me to stop and really assess exactly what details were omitted from my stories so that I could fit all that I wanted to say into that five minute window. It was now a lesson in word and detail economy. At that moment, the distinction was made very clear to me between story and plot. The difference came in how I was now able to approach this in a way that was all down to communication. How could I develop a style to express a single thought or feeling in as little words as possible? When the discussion concerns filmmaking, the style is embedded into the stagecraft. Carpenter claims, We only had the style because we had a very slim plot. An escaped lunatic comes back to this town and starts killing these babysitters. A lot of horror can live or die on visual flourish. Horror requires mood and tempo. It's a little trickier, and usually you're suspending some sort of ridiculous premise that you have to make people believe in. How audiences attach themselves to a plot rather than a story, which is the case for many if not most slashes of old, is all down to implication. It's the classic lesson we storytellers hear all too often, show, don't tell. My initial approach to the writing challenge would bear a result like this. The man picked up the knife, stared his victim in the eyes, and stabbed. It did well enough to describe the detail, but nothing to paint a picture that the audience could plant themselves in. Once I was made aware of the necessity of drawing a scene, I wrote this. He advanced toward her with a rhythmic march. His expression seemed alien. This man was no human. The difference between those two is night and day. One describes what happens, the other paints a picture. One tells you the details, while the other forces the reader to be in the room with the killer. The second revision employs that hardwired subconscious fear and puts it right into practice, allowing the reader to fill in those blanks. The camera throughout this movie has to take a perspective. This is one of the few times where the camera exits the exact position of a character and instead assumes the outside perspective of the audience. It pulls us out of the moment to show us something creepy. It remains fixed on Laurie in the foreground, recovering in relief. We feel safe with her, until the panic sets in as we see Michael get back up behind her, obscured by the shallow depth of field. It's also mostly due to Nick Castle's brilliant performance here, owing to this disturbing, programmed movement that makes Michael seem robotic or alien. It's not Laurie's concern that he's unknowingly getting up behind her, it's ours. We're sitting there, crying out for her to turn around. A feeling that has become so familiar to us that even Scream has determined it as a staple to the genre. I'll turn up behind you. Behind you. Specifically in this movie, whenever the camera exits a character's perspective for the benefit of the audience, it's to showcase the spooky, supernatural ambiguity behind Michael. 
It gives us this unsettling look at our killer when no one knows he's there. It tells us a lot about his behavior. Michael's appearance and actions aren't a performance. He doesn't change anything about himself to frighten people. It's a clever affirmation of the audience's naivety. Michael isn't someone John Carpenter wants us to understand. He's not ever showing us a peek behind the curtain of the act or the illusion of this killer. This is Michael, plain and simple. The erasure of any deeper meaning is horrifying. At the conclusion of the scene, we take the perspective of Dr. Loomis, who has shot Michael off a balcony until his death. We again feel the relief of finality, but won't let our naivety mistake us again. We need to see a body. The objective recount takes hold at this shot, where we see Michael fall down and is followed by another objective bird's eye view of Michael's corpse on the ground. It's not until we take Dr. Loomis's perspective once more to examine the body do we see it's missing. What immediately follows is his revisit to that feeling of dread and insecurity. This one shot in the finale eliminates finality, contributing another layer to this unsettling mystery. And what does this film end on? What are the thoughts that Carpenter wants to linger within his audience? The laboured, muffled breathing of Michael Myers as we venture through an array of ambiguous static shots of the house. Michael still hunts. If the finale proves anything to me, it's how it supports its earlier statements on Michael. For example, when Laurie discovers the bodies in Annie's house and she climbs into a corner in shock, the slow reveal of Michael's pale face hidden in the dark of the shadows is used to exit her point of view. The value of these shots aren't determined by how Laurie perceives Michael, or vice versa, it's how his depiction to the audience frames him as something inhuman. It works in the same way where an objective recount of events stands to oppose a subjective version and show the audience why their treatment of Michael as something supernatural may be credible. What I find so interesting about film horror conventions and its application in Halloween is how it transformed the codes we associate with fear and storytelling into almost entirely subtextual elements. Why do we find Michael Myers frightening? Because humans are supposed to have expressions. They talk, they laugh, they feel things. Michael does not. Yet, he looks just like us? Or with that disturbing mask, he almost looks like us. It's like if a robot or an alien or a supernatural predator tried to imitate the physical imagery of a human as a front. It has all the proportions, all the conventions, everything correct. But it's just not quite right. It's lacking the human element of human beings, expression. Behind that dormant pale mask lies dark impulses unknown to us. Behind that mask lies the complicated, incomprehensible mind of a being who understands only a single objective. Kill. Michael being this blank canvas of a human, an expressionless, silent vessel for murder is what transformed him from just a man in a mask with a kitchen knife and into the shape. The movie takes those words on the page and instead uses stagecraft to trap you. The movie doesn't stop to have someone tell you why Michael Myers is frightening. The movie shows you. John Carpenter has gone on to say that he treated Halloween as more of a stylistic exercise than anything. Though it may seem riddled with cliches now, Carpenter was the blueprint for so much of the genre post-1978. His invention of an array of iconography established so many of those codes and conventions that we now identify horror with. From a technical standpoint, Halloween is most certainly a product of its time, and this is one of the few cases in which I firmly believe that with age, the treatment of this film and its digital restoration is actually deteriorated from the original effect. I'm going to take us back to the point I made earlier about the VHS and its 1 to 1 aspect ratio. This was the original version of the film which was presented like this to account for box TVs. However, this aspect ratio actually served a unique purpose in filling the screen not just for the audience's satisfaction, but also to trap the audience in closer to the frightening imagery. The distortions from how the tape would warp the footage genuinely adds a layer of surrealism to Michael Myers. In losing so much detail, we are communicated more. I spoke before on the writing conventions for horror that when subtext is used appropriately, the reader will take their own fear and project it right into the story. 
In that, I believe the unintentional obscurity of the VHS version mangling Michael's image actually allows the viewer to interpret his human proportions in a deceptively biased way. The movie that we now access on streaming sites and DVD contains only the restored footage which preserves all the detail and grants us a wider picture, which I believe actually works at odds with the film's intention to frighten you. Because we can see the detail in Michael's face, we also lose the subjectivity of the choice our subconscious interpretation provided. I feel it's so much more frightening being boxed into the hallway with Michael and seeing his pale white face contrasted against the blackest depths of his eyes. In the restored version, he fits neatly within the frame and we can actually see some of the detail behind his eyes, which honestly breaks that immersion of the boogeyman for me. The same effect happens during the aforementioned framing of Annie's house across the road where Michael stalks from. In the restored footage, yeah, it's unsettling seeing him standing there and staring. But in the original footage, he is reduced to an assortment of black pixels taking the form of a human silhouette tucked awkwardly into his surroundings. To me, it's far more terrifying seeing something that we think is human stalking us. In the restoration of the original film, we have a preserved hallmark of horror iconography and I'm deeply grateful for it. On the other hand, it's within that preservation have we lost an important layer to the haunt that was John Carpenter's Halloween. I do think it's within that very deliberate marriage of how it was shot and how it would be presented to audiences that determined how the film needed to be interpreted. See, Halloween isn't shot for coverage. When we get to the meat of the story, when Carpenter wants to evoke a feeling, no single shot is lazy or wasted. The cinematography exists to give perspective, and at the end of the day, that's what cinematography is. It's there to tell a story within its own context. It's more than just something that you can fit into a Twitter post. Cinematographer Dean Cundy states, Working with John was a revelation because suddenly, here was a guy who was interested in using the camera in a creative way drawing the audience in. The movie opens with this disturbing one take following a young Michael Myers stalking his sister before stabbing her to death, a shot inspired by Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho almost 20 years earlier in 1960. The idea to open the movie with this long take to keep the audience in a single moment as long as possible was inspired by the opening of Orson Welles' Touch of Evil from 1958. Combining the stagecraft of the continuous one take with a point of view shot from our killer was made possible with the Steadicam, which, now a Hollywood staple, was only developed in 1975. This plants us directly into the perspective of Michael, whose actions aren't depicted with any justification. This was a new technology that we, by the seat of our pants, learned to use. There was nowhere to learn yet. John wanted to do something for the opening shot that took advantage of the Steadicam, and that would be completely new and innovative that you couldn't do with conventional camera shots. Right from the opening scene, we are visually told that Michael killing his own sister isn't a point of contention for him. It's not an internal struggle or a euphoric release of anger, it's just what he does. It negates any discussion of rehabilitation and frames our killer as an evil that cannot be reasoned with. The fact that our story starts at this point and doesn't give any prior context establishes early on how socially and emotionally removed Michael is, and it's frightening. When we finally see Michael, we're told that these aren't the actions of some old, disturbed murderer. It's just a child. And this isn't some old, abandoned, spooky house. It is a lived-in suburban family home. Halloween is telling you this isn't happening somewhere secluded or haunted. This is your backyard. Writer and producer Deborah Hill stated, The idea of pulling off the veneer and seeing what lies beneath intrigued me. You put the story in a sleepy town, really beautiful homes, nice full trees, it seems safe. You think nothing could go wrong there, and nothing could be further from the truth. It told audiences in 1978 that their promised bulletproof nuclear family isn't devoid of danger, Halloween established the faceless murderer in suburbia trope as it was what would frighten middle-class Midwestern Americans the most. The story fast forwards to October 31st, 1978, Halloween night, the night he came home. We're introduced to Laurie Strode, high schooler and babysitter. We follow her perspective, framed mostly in medium tracking shots. The visual language is creating a conversation, 
we are with her. We get inserts of her from extreme wide shots, indicating another point of view shot from someone stalking her. Because of the opening scene, we can assume that Michael Myers is our culprit. We sparingly see the story from Michael's perspective. One such example being here, where the audience is given a scare for trusting in Laurie's naivety, conditioned from the livable suburbia that is Haddonfield. Moments like these and the aforementioned clothesline scene are what tell the audience that their hometown is no longer safe from the stalker. It is the twist of the knife, so to speak, of Halloween's premise. Michael Myers is not an outsider, but an indisputable product of Haddonfield and its familial and social order, and thus his invasion of the suburb is simply a return. This is a statement that rings true for Halloween 1978, but also its 2018 sequel, where we are introduced to a new age of Michael's haunting of Haddonfield, where his killing spree continues and is renewed with a brand new energy. Mirroring his escape from a mental institution back in 1978, it's clear that the only thing that's changed with Michael is age, and it has in no way mellowed him. On the other side, we have Laurie, who has understandably never been able to move on from that night in Haddonfield now 40 years ago. She lives out her days drinking in her fortified home and preparing for his inevitable return. This is such a bold and welcome place to take the story that treats the events of the first film with respect. It doesn't take it as just something that happened on the night of Halloween 1978 to the humble little town of Haddonfield, but something that happened to an innocent Laurie Strode. Where does Michael Myers exist in the world of true crime? Where greedy journalists and podcasters alike monetize the most horrific parts of people's lives. Memories that are better left in the past where they belong. Your story is no longer a source of pain, but something that we can sell to consumers. The cold opening to 2018 establishes exactly where the world is at in its recount of the 1978 Haddonfield Halloween Massacre. The discussion, as demonstrated by two young true crime podcasters, is still dominated by Michael Myers. Their visit to the facility he's housed in is played for drama. There's a disturbing aura painted around him. The first time we actually get to see him, he is framed in a wide shot, imitating Carpenter's deliberate composition of him in his environment. Michael, despite being 40 years older, still has the stalker within him. Despite being, again, dwarfed by his surroundings, he knows where you are. Even the opening title supports this as we see this decayed, rotted pumpkin slowly being revived and renewed with a new life in this brilliant reverse shot. A new flame casts the iconic eerie light as the haunting John Carpenter Halloween theme plays. Michael Myers is back. We see the journalist's dramatic treatment of Michael, depicting him as this mysterious supernatural being in contrast to their exhaustive, if not exploitative, treatment of Laurie Strode. They're not here for her story. Not something sympathetic, like the effects of her intense post-traumatic stress that challenge her everyday life, but instead the story of how she has failed as a functioning adult and parent. Laurie lives the way she lives as a trauma response to Michael's killings in 1978. She's treated as an unhinged, ticking time bomb, waiting to blow up. It's a sadistic yet astute depiction of PTSD and how Laurie has been changed irreparably. This movie treats Laurie's PTSD with an earnest understanding and a promise to be truthfully representative of her pain to contrast the treatment and callousness from her own family. Everyone who willingly comes to her is after her story. The people she needs most in her life willingly remove themselves from her. She's haunted by the memory of Michael Myers and her daughter is actively dismissive of her vulnerability. A vulnerability that is buried deep beneath layers of angst and fury, a 
a shell hiding the scared teenager that barely escaped with her life 40 years ago. Michael has such a hold over Laurie that she cannot move through her life without looking over her shoulder. She watches her granddaughter through the window of her school in the same way Michael stalked her. The framing here imitates the same shot from the original film, indicating her adoption over Michael's abnormal behaviour. His imagery has unconsciously consumed every facet of her life. It's again reflected in this shot of Laurie in her car suffering from a panic attack. While she's wallowing in her anger, the shape steadily marches toward her in the shallow background. This shot specifically stands out to me as it reminds me of this shot and how the depth of field responds to Michael's presence. Laurie's PTSD alerting her that he'll always be behind her, stalking her. He will always haunt her. The sheep. I wanted to kill you. A single moment in time can be suffocating. All these feelings that she's repressed are just as easily brought to surface. Michael Myers is the pure embodiment of evil, a seemingly supernatural force that, if not already proved himself to be deadly dangerous, is psychologically tormenting. If the acting and the writing doesn't communicate that enough, compare the scores between the films. In 1978, the music pioneered a soundscape for horror. John Carpenter himself creating the score for his own film proved that this stylistic exercise of his was deliberate in every facet. The electronic synths and sharp stings cemented themselves as horror codes. In fact, initial screenings of the movie were deemed so neutral that Carpenter knew he had to save it with the music. One of the techniques he uses to make us feel unsteady is its irregularity. The constant uncomfortable movement forward that forces the audience to suspense. All of these elements became so iconic to the horror genre, and particularly for Halloween, gave it this sense of unease and abruptness, as though something was sneaking up on you and then killing you before you realised. Then when looking at Halloween 2018, the music imitates itself before transforming into a new age of horror, indicating a new reign of terror for Michael. Do you know that I pray every night that he would escape so I can kill him. Halloween 2018 feels like an entirely different echelon of its treatment of its characters as a slasher film. It adopts modern codes and conventions to elevate its thematic core and deepens its impact as a reinvention or revisits to the haunting of Michael Myers in an all new age. I'm not going to class this film as elevated horror, as the term feels a little disingenuous and dismissive of the rest of the genre for me. It implies that merit only lies within the stories that tackle hard themes, when in actuality there is plenty of enjoyment to be had in the simple goofy slasher film. Also, pretty much every horror film, intentional or otherwise, has subtextual, political, emotional or identity discussion in some form. So to say that the films that remain apolitical or uninvolved with a deeper, more meaningful discussion are any worse than the ones that very clearly do feels like an uninformed way to approach these stories. So when I say that Halloween 2018 takes a new approach to the story, I am talking entirely about everything concerning the filmmaking. Because holy shit does this film rock. When we consider just how iconic Michael Myers became due to John Carpenter's expert creativity, it would be distasteful to exclude just how important his director of photography, Dean Cundy, was in attributing to what we associate the killer with. Halloween was more about using the camera to get the audience emotionally involved. John wanted to be a visual storyteller, and I wanted to do the same. Uh, struggled sometimes to try to get directors on on previous films to, to do, you know, storytelling shot, dolly shots and things, and, uh, but John was absolutely all about that. The way that Michael was physically framed within the story, whether he was inside a shot or not, all contributed to developing a presence to him. Even when he's not in the shot, we feel his presence. Even when he isn't in the shot, we are aware that he's watching. Before, I said that Halloween isn't shot for coverage, that everything, no matter how big or small, is entirely deliberate. It was a stylistic exercise. This extends beyond the lens of how the audience views the story and into the way that Michael is framed within that lens for a specific purpose. Those wide shots that safely blend him with his environment reflect the notion of societal conformity, 
because without considering the context, why wouldn't he blend in? He's literally wearing a blue collar uniform, he's one of us. The non-conformist anxiety sets in when that exact same framing follows him wandering the suburbs late at night, when he should be inside enjoying a nice home cooked meal with his family. By recontextualizing that same framing, we feel two very different things. The context that this serial killer is fresh off a murder and out for another paints this isolating imagery of him. You are no longer safe within your own home in your quiet little neighborhood. Subliminally, the framing of these shots are what frightens the audience. This is, for me, the absolute best of Carpenter and Cundy throughout Halloween. For its 2018 successor, director David Gordon Green and DOP Michael Simmons had the Herculean task of reintroducing contemporary audiences to The Shape. After making the switch from cinematographer Dean Cundy to Michael Simmons, the focus was on taking the film craft elements that determined the audience's perception of Michael and use those elements to build upon that foundation. Whether by keeping his unmasked face out of the frame to build immersion, to framing him in a wide over the shoulder of another character to plant us directly in the point of view of his next victim. In fact, it's in this shot sequence that I love the use of lighting and framing. It nearly perfectly silhouettes his proportions in the dark side of the frame so that our only grasp on Michael being there, silently watching, is through the unsettling paleness of his face staring back at us far off in the background. The context of Michael appearing in this scene out of nowhere continues to cast this suspicious, disturbing aura over Michael's intentions. We know he stalked Oscar here to size him up as his next victim, and the framing suggests that he's waiting to make his move, confirmed by the preceding moments where he disappears in between the flashes of the sensor light turning on and off. The moment is also played for a laugh as Oscar mistakes our bestie serial killer for the homeowner and big man just looks adorable here. You ever really liked a girl and you just couldn't have her? Oh, this shit's hilarious. Thank, thank you. For it's followed up by Michael being again silhouetted by the blinding light behind him, framed in the lower half of the screen. It taps into the abject horror of the suburban serial killer established in Carpenter's original film. The setting is entirely normal, it's simply the backyard of a home, but the pacing, the framing, the silence, and most importantly, the performance ties it back to the unsettling non conformity of what should be a totally normal interaction between a kid and his neighbor. The silence here speaks volumes. On one level, it's comedic, but underneath that surface, it's horrifying. Once the audience moves past the humorous nature of the man who isn't sociable, they're subjected to the fear that this man is deliberately antisocial. That he's not here for a quaint chat, he's here to kill you. It again addresses my discussion of how the lens of the movie changes. In this same scene, when the shot is on Oscar, he's framed in a mid shot. Now, if the relationship between the two characters as perceived by the camera was fixed on exclusively point of view shots, logically both characters should be framed in wide shots to indicate 1. their adjacent perspectives of one another, and 2. the distance between the both of them. The use of wides from Oscar's POV depicting a more subjective recount of events, as opposed to the more objective mid shots from what would be Michael's perspective, paints a clever and quite subtle character distinction between the two. The audience, when viewing Oscar, are indicated that the person he's talking to off screen is only within close proximity, which is why the deception of the cutback to his over the shoulder reveals a disturbing truth that Michael isn't engaging in a conversation, but is stalking him from afar. It's from this visual language do the audience attain both the comedic effect of Oscar's deplorable misread of the situation and the unsettling Hitchcockian bomb under the table. We know the fuse is lit, and there's only a matter of mere moments before the boom, but the incomprehension of the very real danger Oscar is in by being in range of Michael is what introduces the terror into the scene. We know what he's capable of, and we know that at this point, Oscar is pretty much a write-off. It's this perfect yet simple stride of fear that I believe makes Michael Myers so terrifying in 2018. To take the discussion back to the brilliance of John Carpenter's new reimagination of Halloween soundscape, we're introduced to the delicious sounds of a violin bow on an electric guitar. Mm, it gives Michael audible presence. Ah! 
he's powerful, he's back. As put perfectly by this YouTube comment, this is the point in the movie at which Carpenter's 1978 score is no longer used, until the end credits, switching to an entirely original one. This is the moment that Allison realised that the Boogeyman is real. It's no longer just Laurie's story. At this point, the torch has been passed to a new generation, and so a new musical theme is fitting. It's the moment in which our newest hero meets our oldest villain. Of course, I couldn't talk about how the lens of the story shapes the fright we feel without discussing the absolutely perfect sequence of long takes at the midpoint of the film. Laurie spends the first act dreading the carnage Michael would wreak should he return to Haddonfield. Her severity of that chance is continually dismissed by the people around her. As the audience, we know exactly the havoc that would come from his return. In fact, as the audience, that's exactly what we expect. Our dreadful affirmation arrives at exactly the 45 minute mark, which I would argue commences the second act of the film brilliantly. David Gordon Green takes us right back into the feeling of Halloween night in Haddonfield, littered with naive children, unaware of the creeping danger they're in. The score is replaced with the sounds of a busy night of trick-or-treaters causing mischief and enjoying the spoils of their celebration. It sets the mood inappropriately. The story is stepping back to the wider lens of Haddonfield, until it's interrupted by the sharp sting of Michael Myers' theme as he enters the frame, assessing his surroundings. This serial killer haplessly blends into the hordes of costumed children running about. This is the beginning of the new Haddonfield Massacre. And oh boy, Michael is not wasting a second. He makes an immediate return to his signature stalking and killing as he makes his way through the neighbourhood in a delicious series of long takes spanning four minutes. The way in which the camera frames Michael as we follow him throughout the sequence is a spectacular display of my discussion. In this movie, Michael Myers is betrayed by James Jude Courtney, who I believe gives such impactful behavioural iconography to the character. Nick Castle, who played a 23-year-old Michael Myers in 1978, gave us the character we knew him to be for so long. The fixed, deadpan silence that is stalking. The curious head tilt as he examines the fresh corpse of his victim, as though he is a child admiring his artwork, sizing up the animal he's just tortured and killed. But it's in 2018 where I feel Courtney communicated this hollowness in his performance this robotic-like nature to his body language, theatrical in a way that doesn't feel human. His body language reflects a soldier, the subtle yet very deliberate movements that communicate to us Michael's comprehension of thoughts. It provokes more questions than it answers and makes him something of an enigma. Why does Michael Myers want to return to Haddonfield? Why go home? It's suburban, it's normal. What does that say about him? Does he think? Does he comprehend thoughts like us? It's this spiral of questions that I continually find myself asking the character and left receiving no answer. I believe it's from this call into the void without any reciprocation that makes this useless pursuit of understanding Michael Myers so frightening and appealing to me. Now he's older, he's slower, but he's so much stronger. He's so much more patient. I think that his inhumanity is reflected no better than here in this very scene. The shot begins following two children before Michael enters the frame. He doesn't react to the children walking into him. He is already stalking, assessing his surroundings. With the acute calculation of a robot, he turns and we follow him over the shoulder into a backyard where he grabs a hammer. The classic Halloween theme accompanying the beginning of his next wild homicidal spree. We follow him through a window approaching the house from the back, entering the home silently. The blocking of the scene keeps the camera fixed outside the doorway so that we can only hear him killing his victim before he picks up his iconic kitchen knife. The shape is back in his element. We continue following him through the house over the shoulder when oh, oh my god, can you hear that? Oh. Michael's light motif returns with a new synth that kicks fucking ass as he exits the discretion of the home and enters the expansive, busy Halloween street. More victims to his slaughter. As he steps onto the footpath, he blends in with the scores of costumed children once more. His costuming again allowing him to assign any occupation of the neighbourhood, whilst his creepy mask wouldn't look at all out of place on this night of all nights. 
the perfect double threat. The camera pans around to his side so that we get an objective view of him assessing his surroundings once more before his attention locks onto a couple to his right. The focus pull indicates the snap precision of his mind, calculating infinite variables. The camera moves past Michael and onto the couple, capturing a single exchange from their conversation. His exclusion affirming just how invisible he is on this night. The camera lingers on them long enough to assume his point of view as he stalks them. The camera moves back to him. He is so perfectly imperceptible to the groups of children and parents moving around him. Then, his attention changes once more, looking to his right to be followed by a focus pull once more, indicating his new objective. The camera drops to a low angle, framing his hard clench on the kitchen knife as someone passes by the door in their home, unaware of his approach. It's simply through this framing that we know Michael's moving to make his next kill. His expressionless face gleams off the reflection of the window as he stares in at his prey. The music tingles. The shape is ready to kill. The camera locks in at this position, telling us that this is his next victim. The framing tells us we will remain here to transition from Michael's point of view to an observational role, watching helplessly as he exits the frame, re-enters it discreetly and silently advances toward the woman in her home. The music builds with suspense. His shadow grows as he approaches her, dwarfing the entire right side of the frame. The camera remains frozen as we see Michael enter from the background, the shallow depth of field obscuring the dormant expression fixed onto his face. He kills her and exits the frame to find his next victim, not wasting a single moment. No movement is without purpose. I love this entire sequence as it shows his method of stalking and killing while using the discretion of his guise and environment to remain invisible. It's haunting how easily he can just sneak up on people and expertly murder them without anyone's attention. The camera moving between tracking his movements and giving us an outside look at his actions allow us to see the ease in which he is able to kill. If the camera followed his entire point of view for the duration of him killing his victims, it might frame his actions as something the audience needs to understand, but the deliberate action of remaining neutral when he stabs people serves to reflect his interior lack of voice. He isn't killing for sport, he's not deterred by any emotion, he is a robot adhering only to his programming, and he knows only a single directive, kill. The camera in this sequence makes no movement without purpose. Everything that we're shown is shown for a reason. The way in which his actions are delivered to us are framed from one or more perspectives for a reason. The camera imitates Michael's acute control over his own composition and stalking. The camera pauses and locks in place the same way he does. The camera moves in to eavesdrop on someone the same way he does. Even purposely keeping wide and observing him as he kills someone serves to show how psychologically removed he is from his own actions. It moves the audience into his interior lens to show how he processes murdering people. Remaining with Michael for this incredible four minutes of stalking gives us this perspective that David Gordon Green is trying to communicate to us. Trying to understand or justify this monster is futile. We've seen it from his perspective twice now, both in long takes, and there is no attempt for empathy. There was no question that once the Captain Kirk mask came out, it was really unsettling. We knew we had what we needed. I think all you had to do was look at that mask and say, something is desperately wrong here, and I'm scared. I think it's within Michael Myers' face, so to speak, that I attribute so much of this psychological torture. The concept that the root of this dark evil is buried behind an almost human-like expression is haunting. The pale white discolour conflicts with its proportionate moulding. The shadows that fall over his face sharpen his ghost-like appearance. Where we expect to see eyes, we're met with a dark abyss warning us away. It reminds me of a brilliant line from H.P. Lovecraft. But strangest of all were his eyes. Twin caves of abysmal blackness, profound in expression of understanding, yet inhuman in degree of wickedness. In the same way that the alchemist described in that story is to appear only so vaguely inhuman, so does Michael Myers. Even down to his costuming with the mechanics overalls tells us that he should be a functioning, working class member of society. 
a mechanic that we would overlook as a murderer because he fits the status quo. It harkens back to that idea of the nuclear family and this tight-knit working class neighborhood that everyone has a role in society. We're all in this together. So having Michael reflect this distorted imagery of an ordinary working class mechanic is a perfectly unique visual storytelling device that he could just be another face in the crowd. There's no performance here. He doesn't dress in a way to deliberately evoke fear, he just dresses as a product of his society, the same way any man in that time would. It's this deliberate sincerity that John Carpenter takes his character with. The idea that he's placing Michael Myers in our world, in our neighborhood. By excluding the bells and whistles of deliberately scary imagery, he creates an unsettling sensation that's ingrained throughout Halloween 1978. This feeling that you too could glance out your window and swear, just for a second, that Michael Myers was standing in your yard watching you. You might want to close your blinds, by the way. To draw a comparison point, take the iconic Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street. Throughout his many sequels in the 80s and 90s, he always appears as this surrealist, scary performance killer. He toys with his food before devouring it. He's always in power, and you feel the claustrophobia of the victim caught in his nightmare. People who are at the mercy of their own sleep. It feels isolating watching these teenagers call for help to no avail as they're only in danger in their own subconscious. It eliminates the chance for an outside party to save them. What Halloween does within its use of Michael killing teenagers in suburbia is ground everything in a layer of realism. That when these teenagers do call for help, there is a chance that someone can indeed come to their rescue. A Nightmare on Elm Street evokes distress in the audience through treating its stakes with a surrealist ambush. Halloween, however, evokes desperation in that these teenagers have a chance at escaping, but Michael is always just one step behind them, following them silently until they corner themselves. Freddy Krueger is a favorite horror villain of mine because of how entertaining he is. He's goofy, he knows he's in control, and consequently he taunts his prey with quips, manipulative comments, and spectacular displays of supernatural prowess. It's why watching him get defeated has this sense of finality to it. Hooray! There is a way to escape his nightmare and beat him. But just when you think Michael Myers can go down like any mortal would, he gets back up again. He doesn't make a performance out of it. He doesn't taunt his victims with a frightening display of supernatural power. He just doesn't stay down. It's the case of actions speaking louder than words. The movie doesn't explain how or why he can tank bullets and stab wounds. He just does. It's as puzzling to the characters as it is to the audience. John Carpenter treats him with such sincerity and carefully crafts his world to be as our own. It's why when everything in this fictional world is dictated by the same logical conventions that determine our own, it is truly frightening that someone can, or in this case, seemingly is, above that. It transforms Michael Myers from being just a murderer in a mask to being the boogeyman. It calls a question to his supernatural talent that remains unanswered. When I do these mental gymnastics in an attempt to understand him, it calls back to the one simple fact that the most expressive part of a human's face, the eyes, remain entirely obscured for him. They are just black pits of nothing surrounded by the palest, lifeless static expression. He is no human. This immersion, for me, is only broken in the finale when he is unmasked for a brief moment before being shot off the balcony and plummeting to his death. However, the preceding moments support this sense of his supernatural invincibility as he is seemingly only vulnerable for the split second he's unmasked. He falls off the balcony and lands on the front lawn with his mask on, and just seconds later, he's gone without a trace. Michael Myers doesn't stay down. Why I love Halloween 2018 so much is that from the moment he dons the mask at the 40 minute mark, it remains on. It maintains the illusion that he is a machine. He is invincible once more. The opening scene is entirely focused on this questionably supernatural presence within Michael's mask. It ponders the question that perhaps the mask is an extension of himself, that he is incomplete without it. This is another distinction that I think does a brilliant service to the character. 
It differentiates himself from other horror villains like Ghostface, whose costume is indeed deliberately scary, if only to cleverly parody the psychotic imagery of the villains who came before Scream. When I think of why I find Michael Myers such an intriguing villain that separates himself from every other villain in the genre, it's the lack of anything remotely human. It's the absence of personality, the absence of any theatre or conduct behind his killings. The line drawn here is where he is such a conceptually brilliant character in all facets, terrifying in every detail, that he has transcended this one-dimensional object of horror and become, for me, a comfort character? Is this what it's like to enjoy horror? Not envy of the murder, but comfort in how fucked up this little guy is? Like, look at him, he's just a little guy, he's a little fucked up, he's got some things going on, but he means well. Maybe? No? Okay, uh, let me put it like this. I enjoy Ghostface for his camp, how frightening and violent he can be, yet how assuming the role of Ghostface in each installment is a certainty for an ass kicking because this guy cannot catch a break. Ah! The comfort is within the control that, yeah, this Ghostface guy is a little goofy and fun to laugh at, but when he means business, he's terrifying, and I love it. When Ghostface mask is removed, so is the facade. It's just a human under there. It gives, in some cases throughout Scream, the opportunity for the villain to be absolved of the mantle of Ghostface. My mom and dad are gonna be so it functions in the same way that when Freddy Krueger is defeated, he begs for mercy and is met with the sweet taste of revenge. Same with Pennywise, who, when defeated, is stripped of all the power he had when conjuring the frightening imagery. However, the distinction between Michael and other villains is that Michael is entirely absorbed by himself. There is nothing beneath. There is no persona. There is no act. There is no character for him to break out of. Where Ghostface works as a parody commentary on the slasher genre, Michael works as the blueprint for where all those codes and conventions originated. He is the origin of that evil. Where Ghostface hosts a parody, Michael Myers displays sincerity, conviction. Both are brilliant, both are entertaining. Both have become comfort characters. I think it's within this almost universally unconscious habit of deconstructing how and why certain characters are appealing, do they evolve into comfort characters? Like, I know the parodic yet violent material to expect with Ghostface, and I love him for it. I know the unsettling and hypnotic cruelty to expect with Michael Myers, and yeah, I love him for it. So is this what it's like to find a comfort character in horror? For me, it's beyond just the visual representation, the astonishing performances, and appropriately haunting score. For me, it's also that perfectly meticulous marriage between that concept and the method in which that is delivered that transforms Michael Myers from just another horror villain and into a deconstructive lesson in iconography. He's not just the film's antagonist, he's the fucking shape. I get excited when my friends show me goofy fan art of Michael. I get excited when I see someone playing as him in Dead by Daylight. Because although he has become such an enthralling staple of storytelling, something that I can study and apply to my own stories, he's also just so much fun. He is indeed just a little guy. Along the line of assorted Halloween sequels, pseudo sequels, reboots, and I don't fucking know, maybe stage play musicals at this point, Michael has been a little lost in translation. But the through line for this character in every single entry is that he has remained this unkillable, inexplicable machine of terror. Michael Myers is a character who I don't want to understand. He's a character I want to dread. He's a character who I can believe could be in my backyard watching me in privacy, stalking me. He's a character spectacularly brought to life by the very considered approach to how the audience is set to perceive him. The reason why I love Michael Myers comes from the clash of his inhuman appearance, conceptual society inconformity, and the idea of a supernatural force that cannot, will not, ever, stay down.
Hey everyone, thank you for watching the video. I'd also like to take this chance to say that I'm opening a Patreon. So, if you liked what you saw today, or you're a fan of the channel, if you'd like to go check out what I have done previously, um, you can support me monetarily. There's a couple of different donation tiers you can choose from, and any money earned from it will just go right back into funding these videos. I'm working on a few short films at the moment, so any money you can throw my way will go directly into funding equipment, and hey, if you choose the right tier, you can become a producer for these videos, and your name can appear in the credits, and hey, I'd love to have you on board, so thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next video.